Murder in a corporate office. Financial crimes and possible mob ties. A CEO with a surprising past. Now even though this story takes place almost half a century ago, people keep coming back to it. But of all the failed auto startups, why are people still captivated by the story of the 20th century motor car corporation? Patience, jeez. I'm gonna tell you. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on The Dale. Thank you to The Zebra for sponsoring today's video. I love big wheels and a powerful engine. Guess you could say I'm a real car girl, but not just any car girl, an invisible car girl. Hi, I'm Mrs. Transparent, and when I need to take care of my car, there's nothing I love more than transparency. That's why I use the Zebra. The Zebra is a car insurance comparison site, and like me, they're fully transparent. You can shop for car insurance without ever dealing with spam calls or marketing texts from random numbers because they don't want your data. Zebra doesn't just pick their favorite insurance companies, you're their favorite. And they could save you over $400 a year on car insurance, so the choice is, unlike me, easy to see. Go to thezebra.com slash up to speed to compare quotes for free and find your perfect policy today. Ow! Honey, my finger was there. Oh, I'm so sorry, babe. I didn't see it. <laughs> of course you didn't see it. <gasps> you know I'm sensitive about my vision. DeLorean. Tucker. Vector. I hardly even knew her. The graveyard of fallen auto startups is far from empty. All struggled with financing and delivery dates. Even tech giants like Dyson, the guys who make the best vacuum, and Apple, the guys who make the best watch, have dipped their toes in the water only to realize that making cars is a tricky business. Tesla and maybe Rivian, we'll have to see, is kind of the exception that proves the rule. But even after a decade of success, their cars are plagued with quality control and reliability issues. And in the 70s, one company found out just how hard it really was and became a notorious scandal. Because of the gas crisis, Americans were ready to trade those underpowered living room sized luxury mobiles for smaller fuel efficient economy cars. We've talked about this a million times on this channel. We made a video about it, check it out. But no one was really making them in the US yet. So there was a Y open market for anyone daring enough to go up against the big three. Which brings us to Dale Clift with two Fs. Now Clift was an inventor and avid motorcyclist in Los Angeles. A few years before the crisis, Clift with two Fs built the commuter cycle, an inexpensive motorcycle based all weather vehicle for cruising around SoCal because you know, we have so much weather. It was made of simple metal tubing covered in red naga hide, a fake leather that covers hot tubs mostly. And it was powered by a 305cc Honda Superhawk motorcycle that was welded directly into the frame. Yes, I said motorcycle, not motorcycle engine. It used the whole bike. Basically, he built a roof. Now, even though Dale saw his vinyl tricycle as a minor engineering success, he wasn't trying to be no business business daddy. And we wouldn't still be talking about it today if it weren't for someone with, let's just say, grander ambitions. Enter Geraldine Elizabeth Carmichael. Now Liz was an associate at the United States Marketing Institute, one of those firms that promised to connect wacky inventors with business daddies. You got an invention? We'll find you a daddy. Liz was on the hunt for an ultra efficient commuter car, so when Cliff's eye-catching prototype got someone in a restaurant restaurant to connect with her, she was stoked. Liz met Clift and offered him $1,001 for his invention as well as a promise of $3 million in royalties once the car went to market. She also named the car Dale in his honor. Such a kind, thoughtful woman and such a good name for a car. Turns out Clift would never get that money. So who was this lady? Here's her side of the story. According to Liz, she built her first car at 18 years old. Then she got a degree in mechanical engineering. She also casually married a NASA structural engineer whose death left her a single mother of five. Now you couldn't engineer a better origin story for the women's lib movement. 
All right, tack that onto the fact that Liz wanted to, quote, rule the auto industry like a cream. And you got yourself a star, pal. Liz was also a libertarian and named her new car company the 20th Century Motor Car Corporation. After a business in Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, a great movie starring Sean Hannity. As a staunch individualist, Liz was unapologetic about her motivation for going eco-friendly. Sure, creating a fuel-efficient car was great and all, but she was actually looking to capitalize on consumers' fears about the gas crisis. Liz told the world that the Dale would have an 850cc motorcycle engine capable of getting 70 miles per gallon, all right? Just for context, other cars at the time averaged 11.9 miles to the gallon. People freaked. And a deposit of $500, the prototype got a whole bunch of attention. Like a bulldog wearing Oakley's attention. Public wasn't even turned off by the Dale's banana on wheels appearance or its unconventional three wheel layout, which reduced the car's weight and friction. Folks had a Vietnam hangover and the gas crisis got them scared. They were ready to feel some optimism. 70 miles per gallon, fill her up, baby! But here's the thing, people weren't gonna plunk down deposits for a motorcycle with a hot tub roof on it. St. Mad Max, Pleatherdome, all right? So even though the efficiency claims weren't completely unrealistic, there was definitely an asterisk to them. With a small displacement motorcycle engine and a frills-free body reducing weight wherever possible, 70 miles to the gallon was, theoretically, Doable. But the line between motivated entrepreneur like him and snake oil salesman like him can start to blur once you begin drinking your own oil. Now Liz was so certain of the threat that she posed to the Detroit Big Three that workers at the 20th century's California offices remember security being nuts. Like 2007 iPhone development lab nuts. And there were a lot of bodyguards, big dudes in pinstripe suits, brass knuckles. There were also fat stacks of cash that appeared on Liz's desk every Friday, briefcases full of it. In fact, with 357 Magnums next to him. Ring, ring, hello? Good fellas, we got a mob situation over here. But if private doubts were forming within the company's ranks, Liz's success only seemed to be picking up steam in the national consciousness. The Dale was getting ever more press attention, thanks in no small part to Liz's larger than life persona and canny ability to drive the media narrative. And she was honing her origin story. In the age of the feminist movement, the tale of one woman going up against the big three of Detroit was a layup for magazine covers and TV interviews. Liz also got wilder with her claims about the Dale's selling points. She said its body of rocket structural resin. I think she made that term up. Called Rigid X. Definitely made that one up was nine times stronger than steel and would never dent or shatter. But Liz was so sure about its miraculous plastic construction that she even took her own engineers to a shooting demonstration. She fired a revolver at a rigid X cup and it fucking shattered, dude. <laughs> it blew up. Blew up like what happens when you shoot a plastic cup with a revolver. And that was the last time that a demo ever went poorly. <laughs> oh, man. Regardless of this, the company felt that everything was set to go. Spirits were high. People were firing their 357 Magnums into the air, left and right, like so many Yosemite Sams. The Dale was set to start rolling off the assembly line in June 1975, but there was one little problem. The car did not exist. The dream that Liz was selling required parts fabricated from scratch and the inexperienced team still hadn't delivered anything resembling the car that was being sold. They didn't actually put together a Dale that could drive under its own power, much less anything that was ready to start being manufactured at scale. The hype around 20th Century Motor Corporation and the personality at its center triggered the uh, spidey senses of a couple of reporters at KABC who thought something was fishy about this whole deal. So they arranged for an interview with Liz and when they arrived at the corporate headquarters, they noticed an officer from the LA District Attorney's Office who was himself snooping around. Although when I think a detective does it, it's called investigating. The investigator <laughs> told them to keep an eye on this place, Jack. Now the ABC reporters weren't car experts, so they came up with a plan. 
They paid a retired car engineer a hundred bucks to take a tour of the factory with them. He pretended to be part of the crew. All right, afterwards, he told reporters on air that everything going on inside of that Dale garage was not lining up with Liz's claims. But did this affect pre-orders? Sure did, but not in the way that you'd expect. The publicity had the exact opposite effect. One of the reporters believes sales increased 200%. Now here's a little business 101 for you. Legally, if you're taking deposits on cars or anything that doesn't exist, you have to put that money into a special bank account. Think of it like a piggy bank until the cars can be built. Liz wasn't having any of that nanny state mumbo jumbo. Laws my ass, suck my butt. She needed those fat stacks to keep the lights on, make payroll. So while the ABC report might not have slowed the brakes on the Dale hype, it did put pressure on the state government to take a closer look at the company's shady investment practices. In the fall of 1974, a cease and desist order from California demanded the 20th Century Motor Car Company stop taking pre-orders. Liz blamed the auto industry and their friends in the government. She claimed that there had been acid in the plastic vats, plans stolen, Frickin' locks busted, fires started, false reports turned into various regulatory bodies. And the company continued to collect deposits on the unmade cars in direct violation of the state injunction. ABC captured this on camera in an embarrassing follow-up broadcast that shut the offices down for the day. The conflict between ABC and 20th Century Motors was only heating up. One of the reporters received a cash bribe that he believed came from Liz herself. And it didn't take long for him to poke around and realize that the universities Liz claimed to have gotten degrees from had surprisingly never heard of her. The walls were closing in and 20th Century Motors began to run into money problems. Paychecks started to bounce, but a lot of the people inside the Dale Project were true believers, led along by Liz, who must have maxed out her charisma stats in the character creation screen. She'd gotten her team to buy into the dream of the Dale, and a lot of them weren't ready to turn on her quite yet. Besides, she had one more trick up her sleeve, a thing I like to call Japanese investors. Everything hinged on this. As the Japanese economy was heating up and taking over the automotive sector, a $30 million cash infusion would be the only thing that could finally restore the company's credibility and put it back on the path to success. But in order to pull it off, the Dale was gonna have to finally prove itself on the hardest place for a car to prove itself, the road. Liz ordered her team to get the car running even though it was unfinished. After a sleepless crunch period, the development team brought the working prototype to a parking lot where Liz and her workers met with foreign businessmen for a demonstration. And at the moment of truth, the car started. It worked! But there was one little problem. <laughs> the test driver, eager to resolve lingering uncertainty about the three-wheel design stability, juked hard into a turn that briefly caused the Dale to tip up on its side and scrape its body against the asphalt. Not a great look, and enough to scare off the would-be investors. Liz was irate. She called the test an abortion on three wheels. She got away with words. Now other Tadpole-style three-wheeled cars have proven stable over the years, so what went wrong? According to at least one of the engineers, this kind of minor flaw could be worked out in testing, but sadly, the Dale was out of time and out of money. Oh, and there's one um, other little hiccup. Totally normal stuff uh, for any business getting up on its feet. A guy got shot in the head three times inside their office. The main suspect was 20th century employee Jack Oliver, who had previously served time with salesman William Miller in prison. According to Oliver's son, Miller had come up with a brilliant plan to kill an investigator from the Securities and Exchange Commission. Oliver tried to stop him, they argued about it. Miller turned the gun on Oliver, bada bing, bada boom, bada Self-defense. Good fellas much? Turns out the kind of company Liz was keeping only brought further scrutiny. But that didn't stop the Dale mock-up from appearing as a prize on The Price is Right. Did the prize booker on that show just like not know about the guy with three bullet holes in his head at this point? 
Man, you get away with a lot before the internet. Not that it did anything to stop the heat. Soon after, Liz Carmichael and nine other 20th century employees were indicted on charges of fraud. As investigators had come to believe that Dale would never be anything more than an empty fiberglass shell. When she learned of the charges, Liz and her family went on the run. And this is when the story caught national attention for an entirely different reason. Now, police got a warrant to enter Liz's home where they found wigs and padded bras and what a police report at the time referred to as a device used by female impersonators to disguise their sex. Now, this led authorities to discover that Liz was a transgender woman who had been wanted on counterfeiting charges dating back to 1961 when she still identified publicly as a man. Now, before that, she had been fired from a job selling vacuum cleaners for pocketing customers down payments. Sound familiar? In April of 1975, a few months after going on the lam, Elizabeth was caught in Florida, of course. She was sent back to LA to face charges of grand theft, corporate securities fraud, and conspiracy. Though it had nothing to do with the charges that Liz faced, news coverage fixated on the status of her gender confirmation surgery. And there was a lot of uncertainty as to whether in the eyes of the law, she was a man or a woman. And while awaiting trial, she was housed at the LA County Men's Jail where she was unfortunately and very predictably beaten up a lot by other inmates. She had to petition the court for the right to be addressed and tried as a woman at her trial, which she was granted. Now this was a very high profile landmark case at the time. To many people living in 1970s American society, Liz Carmichael's gender identity was in and of itself evidence of her guilt. And I hate to say it, I feel like it would be the same now. Not only did it mark her as someone living on the fringes of proper society, but to them, the shifting nature of her public identity suggested an ulterior motive. Dick Carlson, one of the ABC reporters who exposed her fraud, focused his follow-up stories on her gender, speculating she'd been living as a woman as a means to both escape the law and get publicity. In a previous reporting job, Carlson had outed a San Diego transgender tennis player, and his son, Tucker Carlson, would go on to continue the family business of anti-trans crusading and generally just being a giant piece of <laughs> you, Tucker Carlson. But to hear Liz's family and friends tell it, her transition was a fact of who she was. She had lived as G. Elizabeth Carmichael for a decade before the Dale was even a twinkle in her eye. And it's not like she reverted to her previous identity when the cops were looking for her, but this was a hard thing to convince the public of in the 1970s. Given her criminal past and her lies about her qualifications and the entire operation she was running at 20th Century Motor Corp, the whole thing was a mess, admittingly. At her trial, Liz chose to represent herself, which is, you know, always a really good choice. <laughs> you want a lawyer? No way. I know best. She called herself a pioneer who dared to go against Detroit. And though the jury deliberated for a lengthy 16 days, eventually Liz was found guilty on 26 counts. Her customers and investors had been defrauded on an estimated one to three million dollars. Liz was sentenced to two to 20 years in men's prison and ordered to pay $30,000 in restitution, but she wasn't gonna go quietly into the night. No, boy. After running out of her appeals in 1980, she escaped while out on bail. Now the story went quiet for a long time after that. The gas crisis and the tale of the Dale faded into auto history. That is, until 1989, when an Unsolved Mysteries episode led to the capture of G. Elizabeth Carmichael, who was going by the name of Catherine Elizabeth Johnson. Liz was found operating a roadside flower selling business in, I swear I'm not making this up, Dale, Texas. Liz served two years in prison and died of cancer in 2004. One of the Dale prototypes is now housed in the Peterson Auto Museum in Los Angeles, along with uh, our trucks. And its story got renewed attention when HBO released a four-part docuseries about it last year. It looked at the details of the case, but also Liz's complicated legacy as a part of transgender history. The story 
of the Dale is complicated, surprising, and tragic for basically everyone involved. Sometimes the only thing separating a get-rich-quick scheme from entrepreneurial genius is how successful it all turns out. Icar is officially back from the dead, so naturally we have brand new Boost Creep shirts to welcome it back. Boost Creeps can be scary, I know, but they're perfectly harmless, I promise. So go get your new Boost Creep shirts today at DonutMedia.com. Thank you guys so much for watching uh, this video. I think this is a really interesting story. I uh, really encourage you to check out the HBO series and check out the Pascast podcast that we recorded about this. Um, very complicated and super interesting and just like such a great character. Hit that subscribe button, make sure you don't miss anything. Uh, you wanna get some donut merch? I'm really, really excited about our merch program right now. We're dropping a new thing every week. My best friend in the world, Andy, makes it all. So go to donutmedia.com to get some of that. Thanks to Nick and Gio and Christina and Joe for helping me make this video. Uh, I love you. <laughs>